Uh, we have two threads sort of running through our prayers and lessons today. It goes all the way from the collect of the day, talking about Jesus' most holy life, to the prophet Isaiah, who was about 700 years before Jesus walked around on the earth, to the words of Jesus himself, this gospel lesson, and some of the words that we have almost every Sunday over and over again as part of the Eucharistic liturgy. Some of it has to do with what we would consider the, the, the footnotes or sort of the trivia in the Bible back in Jesus' day or even before that, and then some of the questions and issues and challenges are just as relevant to us 2,000 years later. It's a little bit of a mixed bag, so I'll go through all of them briefly. First, remember that the story of God and God's people was already an ancient one, even by the time of Jesus. Jesus was a rabbi. The scriptures that he read from are the ones that we think of as Hebrew scripture, or what we think of as the Old Testament. Obviously, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all those in Paul's letters were not yet written down when Jesus was walking around preaching and teaching, but when he's walking around preaching and teaching, he's preaching and teaching um, very close to the same scriptures that we have in what we think of as the Old Testament. So the lesson that we just first read from Isaiah would have already been written down, that Jesus would have been uh, reading in public in the synagogue and preaching and teaching that lesson and others. And in Hebrew scriptures, from the time that God calls God's chosen people, there is this tension, again, for hundreds of years, if not a thousand years or more before Jesus, God in God's wisdom through Abraham, Isaac, Moses, the patriarchs, the matriarchs, the stories that many of us learned in vacation Bible school and Sunday school, from Adam and Eve on through all of those stories, God called God's chosen people for a purpose. And sometimes they were close to God, other times they fell away, sometimes they were oppressed by other godless kingdoms or kingdoms that believed in other gods, Egypt, Assyria, all of those things. But the, through the ups and the downs of the relationship between God and God's people for hundreds of years, countless generations, even before Jesus and up to Jesus' day, on one hand, God promised God's chosen people that they were his vehicle, his instrument, to use the, the modern business phrase, uh, they were the incubator to get something started that eventually God wanted to spread, spread to the whole world, to use the biblical phrase, to all nations. But the first phase of that, the incubator phase, if you will, more often than not, God would tell his chosen people to remain separate from the pagans, those who were outside the covenant, those who did not believe in him or who worshiped their leaders as gods, like Pharaoh and others. And so there's this tension that God's ultimate aim is to reach all the nations and all the peoples of the world, but to do that, first he wanted God's people to stay separate and holy. And part of how he did that was to give them ethical guidelines, the rules and the laws, the most famous, of course, are the Ten Commandments. And over time, as many of you know, the Ten Commandments and other instructions from God were added to, and eventually there were long lists of rules and laws. And depending on which rabbi and which tradition, there were competing versions of which rules were more important, which superseded others, and how to interpret them all. Many are written down in Scripture, others were written down in other places. 
So for instance, when Jesus is talking about and stirring up controversy about what goes into the mouth, what comes out of the mouth, what the Pharisees were happy about or unhappy about his teaching, um, we, it's easy for us to be dismissive. Um, dietary laws are not a hot issue for us today, but they were 2,000 years ago. Some of that's understandable in any system of rules. If you start making too many exceptions, then the whole thing collapses. Or human nature being what it is, whether we're talking about the Ten Commandments or dietary laws or, or Jewish customs or Christian customs, if you start nibbling, once you start nibbling around the edges in our individual lives and together, once you start nibbling around the edges and making exceptions before you know it, well, as any teacher knows, homework due Friday morning at 9 o'clock, if you start saying, well, maybe it's really Friday at noon or Friday at 4 or Friday at midnight or before Monday, before you know it, nobody turns in their homework. It's a silly example, but you know what I mean. So on one hand, the issue of the day being, in Jesus' day, being dietary regulations, that particular one, most Christians, we already know from our Christian tr tradition, um, you know, the early church said, you know what, we're, we're going to take a long list of, of rules and regulations and we're going to make them very short. If you go in the book of Acts, it, it, it really is uh, pretty clear that, um, well, no, we don't necessarily have to keep all the Jewish dietary re uh, regulations or circumcision, but we are going to keep certain regulations, a short list about immorality and a few other things. Well, we can go round and round, and what does that mean about dietary laws or not following dietary laws or the history or the footnotes in the Bible? But as we do that, there is a certain tension that never goes away, and it's not necessarily about dietary rules. It's really the tension about rules in general. What rules do we still follow and why? And more importantly than that, many times when there's an argument or disagreement about rules, it really is sometimes less about the rule itself and who gets to decide who has the power or the authority to set the rules. There's always that. But even if dietary rules or laws or guidelines or prohibitions are not a big part of the church 2,000 years later, we can take the same kinds of questions and just change the examples, and we have the same tension. What are the rules for? Well, you can pick almost any rule in the church, or ethics, or morals, or anything else. But in the church, rules still no different than 3,000 years ago in the days of Moses, a long time before Jesus, rules are still there to guide us, mold us, shape us, keep us from straying too far, getting into trouble, causing harm to us or others. And then there is that tension that never goes away of what does following the rules get us? Or conversely, if we don't follow the rules, does that matter? Simply put, we never get away from that tension that most rules, especially in Scripture, are there for our benefit, our survival, our understanding, fostering the right relationship between us and God. The rules themselves, or following the rules, do not in and of themselves make us holy. On one of our weekday calls last week, I was going through, as I've said many times, going through the Eucharistic prayer. And you've heard me say this many times, many of you. It's okay to take the Sunday Bulletin, the Eucharistic Prayer, you may have one in front of you now, print it out, 
take a pencil or a pen, and anywhere you see the word we, write I. Anywhere you see the word us or our, write me or my. Grammatically speaking, take, take it from the first person plural, we and us, to first person singular, me and my. Sometimes parishioners get a little bit concerned about that because they feel like that somehow they're touching, touching a prayer that's only the priest's prayer. But no, the, the prayer is everyone's. When the priest says it at the altar, as I will in just a few minutes, um, I'm sort of being the conductor of the orchestra, uh, but it belongs to everyone, you as well. So if you take that Eucharistic prayer and personalize it and pray through it, you know, you're not showing disrespect to pray through it at home. That's okay. Um, it can open up all sorts of doors for the Holy Spirit to lead us. But when we do that, for instance, as we'll get in just a moment, when we have sort of the Sunday morning churchy language of sanctify us as the Eucharistic prayer, please bless this bread and wine, sanctify it, and sanctify us also, uh, that becomes sanctify me. And on the call this past week, someone asked a good question. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to sanctify me or sanctification? And I said, well, the short answer is it means to make holy. But that begs the question of how does that work? And Jesus, as far as we can tell, there were different rabbinical schools and different rabbis that would have been either his teachers or or those that his teachers followed as far as interpretation. And it looks as if there were two major rabbinical schools of the day in Jesus' area, and Jesus eventually gravitated toward one that was perhaps less literal, less strict, and I don't want to use the modern phrase of liberal and conservative because that just starts all sorts of arguments and people don't hear anything else, but one rabbinical school that Jesus seems to, to, to have gravitated toward in this kind of um, argument about dietary laws was willing to perhaps make a few exceptions for the larger purpose. And so that tension never goes away. We hear it in this gospel and other gospels. Jesus will heal on the Sabbath, even though some rabbi said that was work and not allowed. Jesus would say, as he did today, you know what, uh, we might wash our hands ritually before eating, not just a matter of hygiene and sanitation, but ritual. Um, but if you eat without washing your hands the exact right way or saying prayers the exact right way, um, it's more important to think about what comes out of the mouth and what goes in. So what do we do about rules or laws, whether we're talking about the Ten Commandments or um, the church's ethical guidelines, Scripture's ethical guidelines, or what I preach or anyone else preaches? Here's what I'm going to suggest, and I think it's biblical. When we are stickler for the rules, whichever rules, and we see them as the end in and of themselves, then we risk becoming, well, to borrow the phrase, pharisaic. Again, which is not a compliment. 2,000 years later, to call someone pharisaic means that they are picky or hypocritical. That's sort of giving the Pharisees a bad rap, but that's sort of what we have 2,000 years later based on these kinds of arguments with Jesus. So if we're not careful, if we become puffed up or proud in our belief that we are following the rules better than other people, then there is a very good chance that we have a blind spot. There's a very good chance that we become self-righteous or arrogant, and we may think that because we have put our binder in the right place Sunday morning, or we have worn the right color, or preach the right sermon, that that makes us holy. No, as we've been reminded the last couple of days in some of our studies, and as we can look back at the collect of the day today, but Jesus' holy life, we become holy because God accepts us, 
And we are made holy not through our own behavior, but through what God has already done through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if we become holy, it's because of the Holy Spirit working in us to transform us. That's the whole thing about sanctify this bread and wine and sanctify us. If we're paying attention, that process of becoming holy should make us more humble and not more proud because we pay attention to who we are and what we do, what we do and say or what we fail to do and say, uh, we usually can't go too far any given day without breaking the rules or without living up to Jesus' standards. Does that mean we throw the rules out the window? We throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. As St. Paul would say in his letters, by no means. It's good to grapple with the rules and the purpose of the rules and not become legalistic or proud or arrogant in following the rules and seeing others who do not. And at the same time, it's not a good sign when we just cavalierly discard the rules. That tension never goes away. If anything, to mix metaphors, trying to follow the rules humbly without becoming proud or legalistic or conceited or blind to our own gaps and failures, trying to follow the rules sort of puts us in the middle of the lane, to use the modern phrase. It sort of puts us in the zone to be a little bit safer and to draw near to God humbly. If we veer off into danger, really make stupid choices and find out that we're, well, we've sort of crashed and burned, if you will, and blown through more than a few rules at once, well, then God still can reach out and pick us up and try and put us back in the middle of the lane. Thank God. but trying to follow the rules. And just as important, if not more important, the purpose behind the rules, humbly, well, it allows us a little bit better, to use the phrase from one of the prayers in the prayer book, it allows us to better cooperate with God's grace. To try and stay in the right lane and sort of swim in the right direction that in and of itself doesn't make us holy. It just perhaps betters our odds of allowing it to happen. So I'm not expecting a lot of emails from you later today and tomorrow morning asking about dietary regulations. That's not the point. We also don't want to turn into nitpicky, legalistic, narrow-minded people walking around with our clipboard or now our iPad um, picking out everyone else's violation of whatever rules and being blind to our own mistakes. But following the rules, or at least trying to, is always a good start. It's not the finish not the ultimate goal, but it does put us in better position and relationship to God to listen, to hear, to follow, and to learn from our mistakes, and hopefully to minimize the damage from them. So I'm not going to give you a long list of rules and regulations, either from Moses' day or Isaiah's day or Jesus' day or our day you can still go back to the Ten Commandments as a pretty good starting place. And we can do a lot worse than those. In the meantime, Jesus' ultimate rule is to love God and neighbor with our whole heart, mind, and soul. That's easy to say, and it takes a lifetime to do. But if you feel a tension between following the rules 
and on one hand not becoming legalistic and on the other extreme not just giving up and saying anything goes, Jesus loves me, so what's the point? I can do anything I want. Well, then chances are you're swimming right down the middle of the lane and that's not a bad place to be. The rules and regulations don't save us or heal us. Jesus does that. But at least trying to follow the rules gives us a better chance to grow into who God would have us become and to stay close to him as best we can now and eventually, ultimately, enjoy life with him forever in a place and condition where the rules ultimately go away because we don't need them anymore if we are with Jesus happy forever face to face. In the meantime, try and live your life as joyfully as possible, as obediently as possible, and not claiming holiness as something we earn or do, but a gift that we gratefully receive. And yes, that includes trying to follow the rules as best we can.